Hi, this is Patrick Heitema with Hooked on Games in 40 Minutes for Saxion University. This lecture is based on previous lectures and the book Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. We're starting with humans and habits and then dive into the hook system. How does it work? And finally, we're going to implement that hook system into games. What does a player want? Well, we can say that the player is human, so let's dive into human needs. Let's take the theory of Maslow. He designed a pyramid with five steps. We start with physiological, safety, love belonging, self-esteem, and finally self-actualization. With the determination of the human needs, we can say that games and apps have to provide meaning and value towards the player. Overall, games are entertainment, so make sure they are fun, trigger curiosity and add an element of surprise for the player. Because every player is not exactly the same, we need to balance it towards the physical, mental and social skills of that player. If we are able to determine what players need, then could we determine what players don't need, what they would like to avoid in games. Let's start with the simplification of the pyramid of Maslow. It's about seeking for pleasure, hope and acceptance. Now we can invert the pyramid. It's about avoiding pain, fear and rejection. We don't like to lose and everything we own is more valuable. How does that work? One of the most interesting findings in behavioral economics and definitely one of the earliest findings has been this idea of loss aversion. And loss aversion is the idea that we get happy when we make money but we really suffer when we lose money. So for example, ask yourself, if I flipped a coin and you got $150 if it fell on tails and you lost $100 if it fell on head, would you take this bet? The expected value is positive, but would you take it? Most people would say no. And if you say yes to that one, what about if the positive was 125 and the negative was minus 100? Would you take that? At some point, most people say I would not take it, even though the expected value, the average of those two outcomes, is positive. Um, also, if you've invested in the stock market, you probably realize that on days when you make 2%, you're happy, but on days that you lose 2%, you're really miserable. And this asymmetry around the neutral point has become very important and it's been calling loss aversion. Gains make us happy, but losses make us really miserable. And there are all kinds of consequences of this idea of, of loss aversion. Uh, for example, it's important to realize that the losses are not just around the zero, it's around where you are. So for example, imagine that all of a sudden I give you some salary. I give you maybe $50,000 a year as a salary. Once I gave you that amount of money, what do you think about the reduction of your salary? Are you looking at it compared to zero? No, you look at it from this new point of making 50,000 and if I try to take something away from you, it's becoming incredibly uh, unpleasant. If losing is twice as emotional as winning, then how does that reflect to games? If a game provides you with three lives, then losing one of them will cause an emotional response. If a player hits the first rank of the leaderboard worldwide, then degrading to the second place will cause a more hefty emotional response than reaching the first one. Players usually collect items, resources and information in the game, so losing them will cause pain and could lead to non-logical and risky responses. So you're playing a game and in that game you find a special, magical weapon. You spend hours in the game searching for the required materials to buy this magical weapon. The moment you have that weapon, it feels more valuable than purely the economic value, so all the time and effort you put into the game. And that's the endowment effect. We humans add personal value to items we own. If another person has the same item, it feels less valuable than your own. Imagine you're buying a child from a family. You know you have to pay more than just the economic cost of that child. If your dog has puppies and you want to sell one of them, then you know the children are going to oppose, because the puppy has more value to them than just the economic costs. Endowment also applies to gamers. 
they will overvalue everything they own, earned or buy inside of a game. With our basic knowledge of games, we can now start with the hook system. The hook system has four important steps. Trigger, action, reward and investment. Let's start with the trigger. The trigger starts the hook system and is most powerful when it's connected towards a habit. A habit needs action. When you don't perform that action, you will feel pain, fear and rejection. Let's do a small experiment with habits. The first thing you have to do is close your eyes. Cut off distractions. So close your eyes. Your brain recognizes this trigger as a ringtone. It's from a phone. Phones are important. You should pick it up or somebody else should pick up the phone. It's not just a simple audio cue. It triggers your brain to get into action. Your focus is rising. It's important. The ringtone is an external trigger. With external, we mean external stimuli, like vision, hear, smell, taste and touch. What is your emotional response when you see other people smoke or smell fresh baked bread or being touched on your lips? When external triggers are repeated many times, they form internal triggers, meaning that certain places, people, routines, situations or emotions will cause you to do certain actions. Why do people pick their noses in traffic jams? Why are people feeling hungry whenever they see a food court? And why do people dress up whenever they have to go to a public party? Whenever we see a red traffic light, we automatically hit the brake. We don't really think about it. And using brakes for a red light is a healthy habit. In games, we experience a lot of external triggers. Information, what we have to do, is clearly visible within the trigger. Take a look at notifications on your phone or advertisements. They tell you exactly what you have to do. In games, the trigger is usually goal or mission based. So in Donkey Kong, we have to get the key from Mario to save Papa. And in The Witcher 3, we have to ask the Nilfgaardians about Yennefer. The trigger tells us what to do, so now it's up to us to undertake action. Action is the simplest behavior in anticipation of a reward. If you press start, you expect to have a good game. If you go to a theater, you expect that movie to be good. If you activate a quest from your quest list, you expect that to be doable and rewarding. The desired behavior is that the player accepts the challenge. BJ Falk from Stanford University made a formula. If you want to control behavior, you have to consider motivation, ability and trigger. You motivate the player by presenting a meaningful quest, goal, mission and reward. The player is seeking for pleasure, fun, surprise and curiosity. There is hope on direct or long-term gratification. And finally, acceptance is about connection between characters, NPCs and the world. Beside the positive seeking, there is also the negative avoiding. Avoiding pain, fear and rejection. We don't like to be degraded in our status or social position. We don't like to lose valuable objects or create incomplete collections. We don't like to be disconnected from group, characters or the world. If we motivated the player, then we have to make sure he has the ability to execute. We talk about time and money and everything has to be balanced towards the mental, physical and social skills of the player. We motivated the player and checked the ability. And now it's up to us to create the trigger. The trigger will notice the player that something is going on. We can use external triggers, vision, hear, smell, taste and touch, or internal triggers, places, people, routine, situations or emotions. Let's take a look at the game, like The Witcher 3. Usually games will use a classical 3x structure. Act 1 is the setup that creates anticipation. Act 2 is the confrontation, doing the challenge. And Act 3 is the resolution, 
getting your reward. The trigger is being displayed on the screen. Talk to the commander of the Nilfgaardian patrol. And we will see how the Witcher adds more motivation to the player to proceed the challenge. So busy, what brings you here? Saw your notice. Can anyone tell me about the monster? I can. The patrol has been lost. Somewhere along the south shore of Lake Windamer. We must know why. What makes this witcher's work? Some brickmakers live south of here. They call their village Byways. Almost empty now. Many have run away. They speak of a monster which kills. Redanians do not patrol there. That would be foolish. And robbers do not attack Imperials. That would be even more foolish. This leaves one option. A monster. You must learn what happened to this patrol. The Empire places great value on the lives of its soldiers. Do this, learn well what happened. The reward will be proper. Need more coin. Offers not nearly enough. This much we can pay. Deal. I'll see what happened to your patrol, whether there really is a monster in byways. Good, good. We created a trigger that moved the player into action, and now it's time to think about the reward. The trigger in our game pushed the player into action in anticipation of a reward. The question is, why? Rewards are important because they satisfy our needs for goal-driven behavior. We like to find new things, resources, and information. We enjoy feeling accepted, attractive, and important. And we are self-motivated on mastery, self-achievement, like completing a list or collection, and high performances. Three totally different types of reward, but do they have a single core ingredient? The reason is dopamine. Created in various parts of the brain, dopamine is critical in all sorts of brain functions, including thinking, moving, sleeping, mood, attention, motivation, seeking, and reward. Dopamine causes us to want, desire, seek out, and search. It increases our general level of arousal and our goal-directed behavior. It's not just about physical needs such as food or sex, but also about abstract concepts. Dopamine ignites curiosity and fuels our searching for information. The reward triggers the nucleus accumbens and releases dopamine. In real life, we have different triggers, completing a list, having sex, eat food, or use addictive substances like caffeine, nicotine, sugar, salt, or fat. In the 50s, they used this knowledge to create an experiment with depressed patients. They used electricity and a switch to give patients the ability to trigger the nucleus accumbens. That releases dopamine and created a happy feeling. Could this lead to a long-term solution for depression? Not surprisingly, the experiments were controversial, but the electrodes did have an effect, especially near an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Heath even let his patients control their own stimulation. I find this button the best. That's number most, two button. Most pleasurable. Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel? I made a small joke yesterday. I don't know if I should repeat it or not. I'd like to hear it. You think it's worth repeating? I sure do. What about a very deep, deep electrode all the way down? You're trying to tell me how it excites you, is that it? Well, I think it's kind of a, I think it's somewhat of a sexy button. Oh. Let's combine that experiment with a monkey in a Skinner box. 
This monkey has been trained that when the little light comes on, it's one of those sessions where I can now get food, and it knows that if I press this lever 10 times, after a little bit of a delay, I'll get some food. If I press the lever 10 more times, I'll get some more food. It understands the task. So what do we have here? We have first a signal, the light coming on, saying it's one of those sessions. We're starting one of those. Then the monkey does the work, and then with a delay, it gets the reward. And what everyone initially thought was dopamine would go up after the reward. That's not when it goes up. It goes up when the signal comes on. What's this? This is the monkey there sitting and saying, I know this. I know the drill. I know this. I'm on top of this. This is going to be great. I know what I do now. This is completely perfect. 100% I'm going for today. Dopamine is not about pleasure. It's about the anticipation of pleasure. It's about the pursuit of happiness rather than happiness itself. And what's most remarkable is experimentally, if you block that rise of dopamine from occurring, you don't get the work. You don't get the behavior. This is not only the anticipation, but this is what is capable of eliciting goal-directed behavior. Amazing elaboration on this, which now begins to tell us something real familiar. Okay, so in this study, elaboration, rather than this design, you press the lever the right number of times, you get reward. Do the work, you get a reward 100% of the time, that's how it works. Now instead shift to where you get the reward only 50% of the time. You do the work and only about half the time you get the reward. So what happens to dopamine levels there this is what they do. They go through the roof. Because what have you just done? You've introduced the word maybe into the equation. And maybe is addictive like nothing else out there. Because the light comes on and you're doing the, I know how this works, this is gonna be great, but I screwed up last time because I didn't get the food, but this time I'm feeling good today, but I'm a total screw up though. And I'm inadequate in junior high school and it was terrible, and I kept, but maybe this time this is my lucky day. And just vacillating all over the place. What we see here is dopamine comes pouring out like mad. It's the uncertainty of the reward. And here's the really elegant thing they did in that study. Now, instead of a 50% reward rate, either a 25% or a 75%. These are diametrically opposite states. Worse news, better news, the only thing they have in common is you've decreased the level of unpredictability and the rise in dopamine winds up being halfway between the 50% and the 100. And what's this about? This is the world of brilliant social engineering by humans, say, in Las Vegas, who understand how to design a place to take a curve where somebody has a gazillionth of 1% chance of getting a reward and making you think because it's the special day in this casino and you especially are so much tilted to the right that you are going to get and humans are profoundly manipulable in this realm. And it turns out so are other species, the exact same neurochemistry. So what winds up being unique about us? And what you see is, with humans, it's the time dimension. You get the signal, you do the work, you get the reward. And the question becomes, how much time, lag time, can there be between the work and the reward to still elicit the behavior, to still get the work coming out? And we have just entered uniquely human terrain there for the very simple reason that probably most of us recognize, which is somewhere along the way, almost all of us worked very hard in school to get good SAT scores, to get into a good college, to get GREs, to get into a good grad school, to get a good job, to get in the nursing home of our children there sort of thing. And what we see is this astonishing ability of humans to keep those dopamine levels up for decades and decades waiting for the reward. And in the most bizarre, unique realm of this in humans, sometimes we could maintain it with a belief system where the reward doesn't come in our lifetime. The reward comes after our death. The reward comes in our afterlife. The reward comes unto the next generations. And there's no monkey out there who's willing to lever press all the time because of what St. Peter's going to think somewhere down the line. So that is unique about us. Are humans like the monkey in the Skinner box? Well, if we consider goal-directive behavior and add the trigger of the notification on your phone, then 
that will release a huge amount of dopamine. This is important. Who will it be? It will lead to action. You will get your phone and see one Facebook like. You will have a reward. You are feeling accepted. That will trigger a happy feeling. If we repeat this constantly, then the moment your phone has a notification, you will have the urge to pick it up. How does this all reflect to games? Well, first we have to define the reward. What is the definition of the reward? We can say that it's a direct or long-term gratification of our goal-driven behavior. We have three types of rewards. The first is the reward of tribe or tribal rewards. We are a species that depends on each other. So tribal rewards are social rewards, driven through our connection with others. Our goal is to feel accepted, attractive and important. When a multiplayer game like League of Legends had issues with trolling, they introduced honor points, rewarding cooperation. Have you ever noticed how the world around you responds to the amount of connection, likes or favorites you have on social media like Facebook or Twitter? The second reward is of hunting. We like to hunt for things, resources and information. Especially when they are unpredictable, they create fun, curiosity and surprise. The reward should be meaningful for the player. Killing animals is not motivating to most people if they are not really a threat. The final category is the reward of self, meaning internal motivations, motivations of mastery, self-achievement and high performances are extremely rewarding. Getting points in a game becomes associated with having fun and points therefore become a motivating reward in themselves. Imagine you're participating in a contest and you're winning. You get the magic refrigerator. Well, the first model provides a soda each time you open the door. But after a few weeks, we give you an upgrade. So the refrigerator provides the same soda several times before a new item appears. A pizza or maybe a burger. This device will trigger hunting. If items are unreachable for a long period of time, their value will increase. People will visit your house and admire that magic refrigerator. So that's your tribal component. If you're able to predict what kind of item appears in that magic refrigerator, you achieved mastery. Do mind that if you have to do repetitive tasks, it becomes quickly boring and daunting. So start with 25% probability and increase that to 75% probability near the completion of the required collection. In the hook system, we have one more step to go from reward to investment. So in the game, players execute action in anticipation of solving the conflict or getting the reward. You could imagine that the game takes one to eight hours to complete and it will cost money to buy the game or in-game purchases. Also, the player added physical, mental and social effort to the game. So the reward of that interaction must be a direct gratification. So we have to praise progression and interaction. And we do that to increase the player's self-efficiency. We use rewards of tribe, hunt and self based on the first three tiers of the pyramid. Investments are long-term rewards and they will release the highest level of dopamine. So they are the strongest reason for players to keep playing your game. Promote the player with more content or data. Give him more options to connect socially. Promote his reputation and give him a promotion in skill. Everything here is connected to esteem and self-actualization, the final two tiers of the pyramid. Now we're familiar with the hook system, we can implement it directly into games. Games are a simplified artificial version of reality. Consider a Formula One race car situation. A gamer will have a simplified artificial version. He will have simplified controls and simplified visuals to have the same racing car experience. Because it's an artificial problem, it has to connect with the internal meaning and value of that player. Probably he likes racing cars or loves Formula One. The interaction of the player is playful manipulation. If he crashes the car, he will not be hurt. 
The player receives feedback on the progression in resolving the conflict or problem of the game. His position will be displayed on screen and maybe there is a handy minimap. Games will have a narrative structure, so let's use a classical 3x structure in a game. In Act 1, it's the setup, so we enable motivation, anticipation, accessibility and a trigger. We explain that there are meaningful rewards, rules and mechanics in maybe a safe environment and we provide feedback on the mastery progression of that new mechanic or situation. This setup will trigger curiosity of the player. In Act 2, the player will apply the learned strategy of Act 1, but in a more hazardous situation, and he will receive achievements or reinforcement based on his performance. This enables fun. In Act 3, it's the resolution. It's the final piece to gain the promotion or reward. So we have to add a surprise element here, otherwise Act 3 will be the same as Act 2. The surprise for the player will be that he needs to adjust his previous strategy to overcome the final obstacle and gain his promotion. Let us create a flowchart of the goal achievement reward cycle. First we have Act 1, where we explain the goal, mechanics and rules. Then during Act 2 we measure progression of the player. If there is insufficient or no progression, we reinforce the player, we guide, we help. If there is sufficient progression, we reward the player with an achievement. That achievement is based on measured performance levels. In the end of the mission or the challenge, we have to check if the player is able to reach the goal. When he's not able to reach that goal, maybe he failed and lost a life, he could need a reinforcement. If the player is able to reach the goal, then we should give him a reward or promotion based on the measured level of mastery. If your goal achievement reward cycle has simple or repetitive tasks, then instill a performance orientation. When they are more complex and require creativity or strategy, then instill a mastery orientation. The reinforcements in your game should praise progression and interaction to increase players' self-efficiency. Your achievements are based on measured performance levels. This enables replay value and player retention. Complement players for boring tasks and give them feedback for interesting ones. Make achievements for interesting tasks attentional. Reward and promotions are based on measured mastery and or completion levels. This will stimulate replayability and players' retention. Different players will have anticipation for different rewards. Richard Bartle made a structure based on two axes. The first axis is about others, players, NPCs, and everything that's in the world. The second axis will make acting or interacting with others and the world. Achievers are acting with the world. They are the center of attention and are the best in everything. The explorer is interacting with the world searching for the unknown and finding exclusive secrets. For killers, it's acting on others. It's about competition and domination. The socializer interacts with others. It's about communication and belonging. Now we can design direct gratification rewards based on hunt, self and tribal. The achiever is hunting for all the best weapons, upgrades and hints in the game world. He would like to master all available abilities, upgrades and hints. And tribal rewards are about the position in best ranking. The explorer likes to hunt and master rare items, locations and secrets in the game. Tribal rewards are a performance indications of world secrets and interactions. Killers are hunting for items, resources and information that allows them to dominate others. They are masters in finding abilities, behaviors and vulnerability in others. And tribal rewards are indications of competition and domination of others. The socializer is looking for items and resources and information that allows him to communicate and cooperate with others like NPC and players. And they are masters in interaction with others. And their leaderboard should display performance indications of cooperation and communication.
we took the most important aspects of the hook system and implement that in a player type structure from Bartle. But of course you can use any player type structure. With a useful structure of direct and long-term gratification, we can start to implement that balanced in a game. The game flows between boredom and frustration and uses three important phases. Onboarding, habit building and mastery. Onboarding is the anticipation of mastery on a new mechanic, rule or ability. Achievement and reinforcement are used to stimulate progression and interaction of the player. During the habit building there is anticipation on a promotion. That promotion is given when the player is able to execute at a peak performance, meaning he doesn't have to think about using that ability, rule or mechanic. The next step is mastery. The player is able to execute that rule, mechanic or ability without thinking in all kinds of different new situations. And remember, you have to create anticipation on a long-term reward from the beginning of the game. Let's see how people are responding to Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Very early on, you will learn that your game's progress is monitored in the Animus memory segments and that you need to finish all missions and collect all treasure and stuff in an area in order to get a bright 100% score for that segment. And the first areas are crafted in a way that it's easy and fast to achieve that perfect score. This feels rewarding. As stupid as this may sound, but our primal gatherer instincts feel gratification by completing things, collecting stuff, filling up progress bars, working through checklists and so on. And this triggers the reward pathways in our brains, which leads to endorphins being distributed. Happiness hormones, so to say. So instinctively, we desire to repeat this success in the future. But just like in the Skinner box, the more you progress, the more effort it takes to achieve 100% in an area. More missions, more treasure, slightly but gradually. But the more areas you have completed, the more you have already invested in that perfect streak. So the urge to not break that chain manipulates you into doing more and more repetitive and objectively daunting tasks. And since the world becomes more open and wide over time, if it's crafted well, or let's say effectively, you will almost at any time find yourself just in reach for something that completes the next section, unlocks the next area or fills up the next progress bar. So that you constantly find yourself thinking, okay, this treasure is so close, I'll just finish that before I quit. And although this is, without question, manipulation, it can, if done right and considerate, make for some very compelling experiences that leave the player with a deep sense of accomplishment. Let's recap. To implement the hook system in your game, start with motivating goals. Make sure everything is accessible for the player and there is a trigger. That trigger is the simplest behavior in anticipation of a reward. This direct reward of tribal hunting or self should be reinforced based on measured player progression. Now we introduce anticipation for a long-term reward a promotion on content, connections, reputations and skill. This will generate the highest dopamine levels and ensures players retention and replayability. Here you find all the references used for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.